Good morning and welcome to our online service for Stony Creek Baptist Church. It is the 1st of February, first weekend of February, February 4th, and it is our Communion Sunday, and it is our prayer and hope to tie the book of Nehemiah into what we are celebrating this morning uh, as we expand again on chapter 1 and uh, Nehemiah. Uh, his mission and his lifestyle as he approaches the challenge of rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. Obviously, we tape this before um, Sunday, and it is actually February 2nd and Groundhog Day, so um, I'm always intrigued by how those little animals uh, portray whether we're going to have more winter or an early spring. So I just want to go across Canada uh, from the Weather Network. And I love their little names. Blazak Billy. <laughs> that comes from uh, somewhere out west. I, I'm not sure. I think it might be in Calgary uh, or in Alberta, I should say. And he says it's six more weeks of winter. So <laughs> I love the name uh, Balzac uh, Billy. And then in uh, Manitoba, Merv, uh, there's going to be in Manitoba an early spring. And then uh, Puxatawney uh, fell six more weeks. A wire to Willie, an early spring. Uh, Shubnak to be Sam, an early spring. Fred La Marmot, uh, an early spring. And then there's even a lobster that gets in on the, the deal. Lucy the Lobster from uh, someplace, uh, probably, I, I assume, in Nova Scotia. Uh, anyway, and uh, Lucy the Lobster uh, saw her shadow, so uh, there's going to be six more weeks of winter. So um, the majority are saying it's an early spring. So anyway, we've had a fantastic winter anyway, so we're, we're thankful for that. But I love these little guys and uh, their names and... Uh, Actually, there's a, a fairly high percentage of accuracy as to what these little um, animals and this lobster predict. So anyway, I just thought it's of interest. It's good for a, a little joke. So anyway, whatever happens, we'll uh, certainly be thankful for each day the Lord gives us, uh, whether it's kind of wintry or whether it's uh, like the type of weather we've been having lately. And uh, we're just thankful for each day the Lord gives us, and we want to celebrate that.
So we're going back to uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. I want to read that again. And uh, so we can just reflect on this and take this in. Uh, next week, we'll move on to Nehemiah chapter 2 and again progress through the book. But uh, just some things that caught me in reading this that really spoke to me that I want to share with you this morning. The words of Nehemiah, son of uh, Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And this week we're reading from the New International Version, not the New Living Translation. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, uh, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws uh, you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you are exiled, if, if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. And there they are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. So may God help us understand this, his word. We continue on this morning with our journey with Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king. We have seen uh, in our opening sermon that the cupbearer was an important and powerful position in the king's court, and in actuality, the running of the Persian Empire. If you were writing a novel or a screenplay, it sets an interesting background for the rest of the story to unfold. And it does exactly that, as we shall see. But it is to that first chapter I want to return our attention again on this Communion Sunday. As we stop and re-examine its content, it becomes obvious that there are many, many striking similarities with what Nehemiah faces and what this Communion table that we celebrate this morning is all about. The servant ministry of Nehemiah and the servant ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ overlap in many ways, many, many striking ways. As Nehemiah champions the rebuilding of the wall, may God build into our character his traits and ultimately the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the joy of the Lord, as Nehemiah says, May the joy of the Lord truly be our strength. We see that in Nehemiah 8.10. And as we gather around his table, may his grace and his love strengthen us for our journey, for the walls God calls us to build. So, where do we start this morning? Well, there is no better place to start than with love. Nehemiah reminds us of the true nature of love. 
Nehemiah reminds us of the true nature of love. It becomes very obvious quickly that Nehemiah is very concerned about the condition of the wall and how it affected, how it affected the safety and well-being of the people in Jerusalem. The people's brokenness, the people, excuse me, the people's brokenness physically, socially, and above all spiritually. He was not a, it was not a response, I should say, of apathy, but a response of deep, heartfelt empathy. When I heard these things, we read, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This was a broken man. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. There it is, his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night, for your servants, the people of Israel. It's very interesting how we have a parallel here in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke says this, And when he drew near, speaking of Jesus, obviously, and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would you even, would you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace? But now... They are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation talking of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Nehemiah weeps over the brokenness of the people's sin. Jesus weeps over the brokenness of people due to sin. What a parallel we have here. Again, note in both settings the destruction of Jerusalem and its walls due to rebellion, rebellion and sin. It broke Nehemiah's heart in his day, and it breaks Jesus' heart in his day. We see Nehemiah's response of love to the situation in his prayer, and we'll see it expand in chapter 2 as he approaches the king to return to Jerusalem and how that all unfolds. We see God's love modeled by Nehemiah in chapter 1 and following throughout the book. We see God's love modeled by him in very, very special ways. We see Jesus' ultimate response of love this morning in this table. It says in Scripture, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's what this table is all about. We see Nehemiah in a way up, up, um, reflecting that as he goes to uh, champion the cause of the people in the city of God. We love him, the Bible reminds us, because he first, he first loved us. Taken from the Amplified, John three sixteen. For God so greatly, it puts in brackets, loved and dearly prized the world. Again, this all starts with God's love, that even that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 in the Amplified. Nehemiah's love. Okay, Nehemiah's love reminds us of the great love this morning that we can only find, my friends, that we can only find in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Nehemiah sets the stage beautifully for how this love plays out in this chapter and throughout the book in such practical down-to-earth ways. Again, pointing. Again, this is all pointing. This is all painting a picture of the ultimate gift of love in Jesus Christ. And that is what this table, that is what Nehemiah, in a way, points to this morning. The great love, the great sacrificial love, the great agape love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And secondly, this morning, Nehemiah reminds us of the importance of fellowship. Not only the basis of love, but the importance of fellowship. This table and Nehemiah's conduct remind us of the importance of ongoing fellowship with God and with one another. Nehemiah talks a great deal in his prayer about confession and walking in obedience and loving fellowship with God, doesn't he? The Apostle John reminds us that as Christians, we are sinner saints. We are sinner saints saved by and living by grace. We have the old flesh and the fallen nature versus the new flesh. And that battle goes on, doesn't it? That tug of war. And this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, John says. In him, then declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. John goes on to say, if we, can, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And he's talking here, my friends of Christians, he's including himself, if we, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is, is not in us. Again, may I emphasize that John is speaking to his brothers and sisters in Christ, to believers. Nehemiah reminds us in chapter 1 of his great concern and passion for the well-being of the people of Jerusalem, of his covenant of love for the people there. John says the same thing in the New Testament when he writes. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also are to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made. John says his love is made complete in us. Paul reminds the church. Paul reminds the church, he says, as God's prisoner, then I beg you to live lives worthy of your high calling. Accept life with humility and patience, making allowances for each other because you love each other. Make it your aim to be at one in the spirit, and you will inevitably be at peace with one another. You all belong to one body of which there is one spirit, just as you all experience one calling to one hope. 
beautiful. And thirdly, this morning, we are reminded of the true nature of servanthood by Nehemiah. By Nehemiah, love and fellowship and servanthood. Oh man, these powerful messages in this first chapter. Nehemiah could have just as easily uh, uh, weighed what he would, would have to give up, wouldn't he? Would have to give up leaving the palace in Susa. What was at risk approaching the king? What was at stake going to the hostile environment of Jerusalem? And what could eventually happen to him if he failed? All these dynamics could have come into play, could have come into play. He could have opted out and said, hey, boys, you are on your own. Not my cup of tea. I'm washing my hands of it. But like Jesus, but like Jesus, he got down and donned the towel, taking the role of a servant and washed as Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Nehemiah, on a parallel context, prayerfully, scripturally, thoughtfully, donned the towel. We are talking metaphorically, donned the towel and struck out for Jerusalem. He donned the towel as, as a servant, as a servant. His job was to follow God's will. He had the heart and he had the backbone. He had the heart and he had the backbone of a servant. Eight times, eight times, my friends, the word servant appears in this longest prayer in, in chapter one. There's nine prayers in the book of Nehemiah, but this is the longest one. But eight times, eight times the word servant appears. I like the way one writer sums up concisely what it means to be a servant leader like Nehemiah. There's so much uh, bound up in, in the character traits of a servant like Nehemiah. This person says servant leadership is an approach to leadership where the leader puts the needs of others before their desire or desires and acts as a servant first. Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of a servant leader, and his life and teaching show us how, how important it is to lead with love, compassion, and a servant's heart. Christians are called to follow Jesus' example and become servant leaders in our spheres of influence. We can all do it. We can become great leaders by showing compassion, empowering others, and creating a culture of respect and collaboration. Leading with love and humility for God's glory makes a positive, he says, makes a positive difference, and it certainly does. Mark 10, 45, I love these words. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The late John R. W. Stott, one of the folks I love greatly, a, a great Christian leader and theologian and writer of our generation, says, the authority by which Christian by which the Christian lead, leads is not power but love, not force but example, not coercion but reasoned persuasion. Leaders have power, but power is safe only in the hands of those who humble themselves to serve. To humble themselves to serve. It was interesting in our Tuesday night Bible study how the folks that attend the study rallied around all these concepts and principles and traits. They did a wonderful job bringing this out uh, in their responses Tuesday night. And thank you, folks. Me Nehemiah's character stands in sharp contrast to any, my friends, any form of pride. His character sets the stage in chapter 1, 
as we read this over and over again. It sets the stage in chapter 1 for the rest of the book. As I close this morning, I want to read this quote. And it talks about servanthood. It talks about following God. It talks about the passion that Nehemiah had. And, and I wrote this in my old Bible, another one of the quotes I wrote in the front of my Bible. It's by Francis Chan. And he says this, and it really stuck to me to think, to think over, you know, what God calls us to do in simplicity. In simplicity, my friends. He says this, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Let me read that again. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. May God help us to have that discernment to pursue those things that really do matter in passion for him and for others as we would glorify him, as we would uh, take the, the, the material that we read about in the book of Nehemiah, about this man, as the new as the Old Testament closes, and take the the story of him, and apply it to our own lives personally. Again, as we seek to glorify God, lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, and to love, to love both them and others. Father, we thank you for this time we've been able to spend in your Word. And just pray that you would be with us in a special way. As we now gather around this table. And as we celebrate through these emblems. What Jesus Christ has done for us. The great love. The great fellowship. The heart of a servant. So Father as we celebrate in these ways and so many others. Just bless our time now, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I was rich, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated the breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You held me in your sight So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood applied thank place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end
So we give folks a moment to reflect before we take part in these elements. It's part of the biblical context or setting to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So I just give you time now to spend some time quietly with the Lord, um, just to do business with him in whatever ways God leads you. So let's do that now. Thank you for the forgiveness we have in Jesus. Amen. Well, the first element is a little cracker I have here that represents the humanity of Jesus. Jesus came in the flesh, was a man, lived his life amongst us, taught and healed and loved, and then went through the terrible agony and pain, the passion we called of the cross, dying in our place because he loved us. He loved us so much. Father, we thank you for this uh, emblem, which represents the humanity of Jesus. Perfect man, perfect God in one person. We thank you for all that he went through to be that sinless sacrifice for us. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And Father, we just thank you. We thank you for how he loved us and gave his very life for us. As we have said, no greater love has anyone that they would lay down their life for their friends. And that's certainly what Jesus has done for us. So we thank you this morning, Jesus, for how you love us. And as a man, how you went through different dynamics and things that we are struggling with and we are suffering with. So be with those people that need your help, especially this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For I received from the Lord, Paul says, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had broken it, he gave thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, let us eat with thanksgiving. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And we have the cup 
the second emblem, which represents the giving of a life, that Jesus gave his very all on behalf of us. He paid the price fully for sin. It is finished. The job has been done. Sin has been paid for past, present, and future. The work has been done. All that's left for us to do to start that journey is to believe, is true trust, is true to appropriate and make his death and resurrection ours through faith, to apply it to our lives. Nothing else, nothing else will get us through the gates of heaven but his righteousness his life given on behalf for us so that we can take on the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. And again, this morning, we just say thank you. Thank you for setting us free. Father, we thank you that your son paid the price and we thank you for this cup. Jesus, we just thank you for all that you have given us and you have given us full salvation, rich and free, the full price, the full payment for sin, totally, totally. And we just rejoice and say thank you. So as we drink from this cup, please bless, bless our time, our thoughts, our, our passions, uh, our, our wills, that we will follow you with all of our hearts, that we will live for you. We will be those folks like Nehemiah that have a passion for you and a passion for others because your love, your love has been shed abroad in our hearts and has set us free, has set us free. We thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. The same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, the new agreement in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink with thanksgiving. My friends, may we be reminded for whenever you and I eat this bread, and drink this cup, you and I proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And as Nehemiah, in one sense, went to Jerusalem, then went back to Susa, then back to Jerusalem, he made a return. Jesus Christ will one day come. He will return. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you again for this time we've been able to spend together with you and with your people. Father, bless this week as we seek to live for you. If you should tarry, again, be with those that need your special touch, that encouragement, that love for you. So, Father, again, thank you for this time of worship. Encourage hearts, we pray, for we ask these mercies in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you, my friends, and have a wonderful week. Amen.